Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. This is the Web Platform Podcast, episode number 107, We are where we are going to be talking all about HyperDev. I'm your host this week, Danny Blue, and with me as always is Justin Ribeiro. Hello, wonderful people. And Leon Rebel. Hi, everyone. So, um, like I said, today we're going to be talking all about HyperDev, and we have two very special desks. Very special desks. Two very special <laughs> guests from the Solid Hyper start, Danny. Solid start. I feel, I feel good. I feel good about this. This can only, it can only go up from here. Two very special guests from the HyperDev team. Um, we have Daniel and Perjan. So, if you guys could uh, just real quick give us a, a quick, give us a quick background about yourselves, who you are, what you do, what you like, starting with Daniel. Hello, I'm Daniel Exmoor. I'm the team lead on HyperDev, uh, and my desk is very special because it's like a standing desk. It's going up right now. <laughs> That's fancy. See, <laughs> see, no, it was relevant. No, <laughs> it was relevant. Say, While you're standing, I'm going to eat a bag of chips because I feel like that balances the healthiness level yeah, of the. You got to keep it balanced. <laughs> it's like a conservation of energy or something. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Perjan. I'm uh, the designer and uh, front-end developer on HyperDev. My desk also stands up. I can't stand because I pulled my hamstring, but what makes my desk extra special is, is that I'm in New York. Them special, <laughs> them special New York desks. Yep, they're fancy and shiny. <laughs> okay, well, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we're going to be talking uh, about HyperDev. So um, I guess, Daniel, on a very high level, can you tell us what HyperDev is? Uh, yeah, so imagine all of your wildest dreams, and they're in a room. HyperDev is the door to that room. You practice this. <laughs> it's all improv, straight off the top of my head. Full stop. Like, I yeah. want to go through I the door. Cast over. I'm opening <laughs> the door, I, I and now... Yeah. So, but more like technically, okay, right, you got all your dreams, you want to achieve them, so you use HyperDev. It's a website, basically. You go to a web page. It's an editor in the browser, and it lets you write JavaScript applications, uh, and in the future, many more kinds of applications. Uh, but right now, it's all JavaScript, Node.js. As soon as you hit the web page, you, can, you have an app running on a server on the internet somewhere. You have a URL you can share with your friends. You can make changes directly in the browser, and those changes within a second are live on your app. So it's the fastest way to develop uh, applications on the web. So the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, like something like Plunker or CodePen. So how is it different to those other similar kind of services? Uh, yeah, so the, a lot of the tools, uh, like there's JS Fiddle, Plunker, CodePen, probably like uh, I think Mozilla has Thimble. There's like 100 of them. Um, many of them are front end only. So if you have, you can't really do server side code. Uh, you can't do like sort of full web apps uh, and things like that. So HyperDev is the main differentiator from those kind of code playgrounds is HyperDev is a full stack environment. All right, so that so so far we've got it, that it like that it also does the, the the server side stuff. So it sounds like it is much more like a, as you said full it, it is full stack. It is a full stack way to build applications in the browser. So I also know that historically myself and I'm sure uh, and I'm sure others have been like fairly wary of like full like web-based IDEs. I don't even know if you would really call this an IDE. But why is why is HyperDev different than a lot of other like failed attempts? And why why is it why is it better? Why does it work? Uh, Persian, I bet you have some. Oh, ideas so I got to answer this. the hard questions. All yeah. right, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can uh, tap out if it's too challenging. All right, I'll, I'll riff. See how far I go. So how uh, HyperWeb is different than other web-based IDEs? I think a big part of it is sort of our our emphasis on performance. So not only performance from the standpoint of like the application, does it like launch really fast? Does it react really fast to you know your inputs? But this idea that as you type, you instantly or seemingly instantly within a second see the sort of um, results of your action. So I add a new route and I can immediately go to the route, or um, you know I add an image um, and it's just there. Um, I think a lot of that is like a lot of that difference is about fluidity. Um, and I guess in many ways, like HyperDev is an IDE in the sense that it integrates like the running and the building of your application. But 
Um, we don't use the term IDE because a lot of us just have a lot of bad experience using like what's traditionally called IEs, like Eclipse and Xcode have like, to be polite, like they're rough edges. I'd call them dumpster fires in some cases. Um, but you know, rough edges or dumpster rough, fires. Uh, yeah, either or. Like <laughs> either you, choose choose the one that you makes you feel more comfortable and makes you hate me less. Um, but the idea is like with hyperdev, like your code isn't magical. Um, we're not using like you're not making a solution or anything like that when you when you make an ex, uh, a hyperdev project. It's just regular code. You can export it to GitHub. Um, you can download it to your hard drive and run it locally if you want. Um, and you can integrate whatever third-party service you want. So it's very open, sort of webbish philosophy. So we're trying to take the best from from both worlds and walk that line. So do you find a lot of people using it so yeah. far? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, this is a little bit of uh, sort of an extension of the sort of initial concept of sort of um, maybe we call them demos or code demos, sort of your code pins of the world, very interesting sort of demos. I mean, you see a lot of people building demos on the stack right now? Uh, yeah, there's. Uh, quite a lot of different projects. Uh, I just checked, I think, yesterday, and we have over kind of 12,000 people who have registered through GitHub uh, to log in and manage their projects. So I think it's growing pretty pretty rapidly. Uh, we've got a gallery with, I think, at, like around 100 apps, I think, and those are ones we selected. Maybe it's 50, but we like selected quite a few different tutorials, uh, getting started uh, things ways to use HyperDev to integrate with Slack, like if you want to make a Slack bot or make a React tutorial or a React template to get started. So you have all kinds of different ways. With just one click, you can be learning new technology on the web and have it published immediately uh, to share with anyone you want. So, I, guess, oh, I was just going to jump in. I guess another important key, a little point to make is that, like, so while we have like 12,000 GitHub IDs um, that have been used to log in. You don't actually need to log in to use the application. Like you can just go to hyperdev.com, type some stuff, have a real web app. Um, so I imagine like the real number of people like that have actually used the app is probably a lot higher. But yeah. 12, like that's 12,000 people who've like cared enough to log in, which I think is yeah. kind of nice. We try and delay the login uh, so that you can at least get started and see what it's about before you have to commit to signing up or logging in or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I like writing all my code ephemeral. You know, that's the way I write code. It's it's there and then just, you know, it's gone. You know, that's how I keep myself employed most days. Yeah. Um, It'll but, still stick around even, like, for a few weeks, I think, maybe a month, you have a chance to, before we clean it up. But we try and so, remind people. <laughs> so why build it? Like, like where, where, like, what gap did you feel like the, the web sort of needed, or not so much the web even, but just developers in general. Because obviously there's a lot of systems out there today that sort of let you deploy code and do things. But I'm sure as we all know on the call, that can be, you know, its own set of, you know, pitfalls and traps. Um, so like, was there a particular thing that said, you know what, we have to build this now because I don't want to deal with that anymore. Like what was the driving force behind finding this? Uh, let's see, I've always been experimenting with like, web-based applications or ways to code things faster. Uh, historically, uh, in a past life, I once did like 90 games in 90 days. It was like one hour game jams for 90 days. And like in order like to even do that, you have to have an environment where you can sit down, finish something, and have it be published live like within the hour. So in a traditional environment, like you sit down the first hour is like, hey, I gotta update my dependencies, I gotta set up my environment. And like you're lucky if you can even get started within an hour, much less publish it to the internet. And yeah, I have you this usually uh, have to wait for NPM to finish in that yeah. first hour. You know, <laughs> seems the first go around. Yeah, wait for Eclipse to boot within the first hour and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like so I just, if you want to kind of experiment a lot and like just dive into stuff, it's a real motivation killer when you just hit these stupid problems, just like every step of the way, it's like, okay, now I have to solve another thing. And some people say, oh, well, that's just programming, but I don't believe that. I think like we can do a lot better. And so this is our attempt at doing a lot better. What's also really interesting to me is that, like, for people who are trying to learn coding, like, if you, you go to, like, CodePen or Treehouse, I'm not CodePen, but um, Code Academy or Treehouse and stuff like that, um, and you say, hey, I want to learn um, programming, and they're like, okay, what kind of language do you want to learn? Okay, I want to learn JavaScript, and it's like, okay, here's how you do if loops, whatever, whatever, but if you want to actually take that knowledge and use it in the world, 
Like there's this huge stack of problems you you now have to like go through and jump through um, before you can even write like a console log statement and see things on the web. So yeah, I think that's it's kind of we have like a weird place where we are I think on the web where our tools are really great, but there's like they're like great in isolation and they're not really connected very well together. I'm sure this this also helps as well just as the uh, kind of the, the not just front end but uh, things have become more complicated. And mm -hmm. so having something that makes it just that much easier, like you said, to jump in. And because I have, um, you know, I have fielded questions from people, uh, you know, like I, I just did some stuff on, I, I think specifically from Code Academy. I was like, okay, like I think I know what I want to do, but didn't know how to include a JavaScript file into their HTML document. Um, it's like, so like some of those little things that just, that get kind of uh, skipped over in the way that they, a lot of time that stuff is uh, presented. <clears throat> so, so you mentioned Node and the front end stuff. So obviously, JavaScript are those the only things? So like, is Node the only um, current back end language that's supported? And does the um, does the front end support any like um, transpilers like TypeScript or, or, or Babel or anything like that currently? And are there plan? If not, are there plans to add things like that down the road? Yeah. So right now we support Node and anything that kind of exists in the node ecosystem so npm modules you can use coffeescript typescript i think someone even got dart working with like a little bit of a hack but so there's like ways you can you can kind of even hack in right now python but we're trying to make it official in the future so that we're going to have official support for python php ruby and things like that and possibly a lot more but we want to make sure that when we do support it, we like really support these languages and not say, yeah, you just do this weird hack and it kind of works, good luck. We want it to be like all these languages to be uh, first class citizens on the platform, much like Node is right now. So you said TypeScript, is that including for like for the front end? Like is it supported out of the box where you just like switch uh, to a toggle or do you have to do it yourself? I think there's probably a gallery example app where someone set it up and so okay. you can use that as a starting point and then okay. it'll be of working and so that's sort of been our philosophy with a lot of these is rather than say like we actually at the very beginning we tried to yeah. bundle a bunch of things in and say yeah you have everything and it's all kind of working like magic but that turns out to have a lot of different trade-offs as well uh, because it makes your like the simple app is all of a sudden a lot more complicated because it could you could just drop in typescript and it'll work uh, and then it makes the startup time a lot slower so what we kind of have uh, shifted towards is the default app is just very simple, basic Express app. But then in the gallery, we have examples of here's how you could use TypeScript, here's how you could use React, here's how you could use all kinds of different node modules, and uh, even for like very specific things. I think someone did a, what was that? It was like a MongoDB, oh, parse. Someone did like a parse uh, server like in HyperDev. So if you have a MongoDB database, then you use this HyperDev template, put in your... Uh, like tokens for your database. And now you've got like a parse server that you can use for your apps. So I was like really impressed with that. Even though it's like actually pretty simple, you just use the parse node module and configure your database. But now with like two clicks and you put in your tokens, you've got like a parse server hosted. So it was, uh, really blew me away. That's really cool. I think, I think lots of examples are really important, you know, getting people to use things and adopt things. It makes things so much easier. So you kind of talked about how this is going to make kind of building apps on the web a lot easier, but often when you make things easier, you kind of have less flexibility. Is this something you imagine people using to build production applications, or is it literally just for demos and learning and those kind of things? Uh, I imagine a lot of people using it for production applications, if only because when you show the prototype to your boss, they say, OK, it's done. Ship it. And then uh... <laughs> <laughs> kind of on a higher level. Production apps. Exactly. I mean, that's. I think that explains a lot of production apps that I use every day, <laughs> unfortunately, or for the best, because they're shipping uh, and they're live, and we can use them, which is great. Um, but I think from the beginning, we've always kind of been inspired by like the Rails model. So when Rails was introduced, it was like, here's a thing to like make a blog post or, or make a blog site or a, a to do list, something really simple, and it was sort of seen by the community as like a toy, um, you know, not for serious work, quote unquote. But like as the tool matures and as people become more comfortable with like the abstractions or DHH's philosophy, like it's not today in 2016, it's not like a crazy 
thing to like run your whole business off of the Rails app. So I think we want to get Hyperdev into a place like that, you know, following a similar trajectory. So with that sort of comes the, the notion of scale, I think. You know, um, the scalability of any platform is sort of key as you start to build things that are going to be used on a sort of daily basis. Behind the scenes, you know, is, you know, how it seems to me very scalable from a front end perspective. Like I can go in, spin things up and burn. But I, I also, you know, I, simplicity with it brings concerns too, right? Like if I'm going to store 60 gigs of data off on this thing, I don't know if I should do that. Not to mention, I don't know if you want me to do that. <laughs> um, as it starts to grow and you sort of start to see this uptick, like how do you deal with that problem? Like, uh, it, you know, is it one of those, uh, you know, is it an architectural challenge to sort of, you know, continuously expand these things into sort of that production level scale that you need as opposed to something that simply serves um, sort of a, you know, maybe a minimum viable product as it, is, as it were now? Uh, yeah, so we are definitely still in beta right now, but as we mature and sort of figure out what the free tier limits are, we would like to allow anyone to store 60 gigs on HyperDev, just say, and this is how much it will cost you every month. And then sort of like that solves a lot of scaling issues if you just say, you pay for what you use. Like AWS, you know, it's uh, super cheap and you it's like pennies to store gigabytes, but it's a pennies every month and somehow if it's not free then all of a sudden you can scale a lot better so we are we do plan to have some kind of like a demarcation of like if you're using it for small apps that aren't too expensive they don't cost us very much uh then it's free and it's fine and you can uh sort of grow your app to a point and if you need to grow it further then we'll have uh, paid options available we're, we're still like working out the exact details of what makes sense to people like what do people feel good paying for what seems like a fair deal. And so uh, in the next couple months as we're coming closer to exiting beta, we'll have uh, that resolved. It seems to me to, me to be very a, a very developer-focused sort of platform. So, you know, if you look at sort of the stack of things, right, you know, one of the things that, you know, a lot of developers don't want to have to deal with is sort of that deployment step. Because as we were sort of discussing a little bit earlier, deployments can be difficult, right? You, know, you have sysops and devops and a lot of ops. There's always ops at the end of something that helps me deploy somewhere to something that I really may not want to know how it's going to scale up. I may raise scalable code, but hey, you deal with the Docker containers or whatever else I'm shipping on. You know, is, is, is that who you're sort of aiming this at? You know, sure, you're going to anger my sysadmin. But at the end of the day, like, it seems to be very developer focused, that ease of initial use. Uh, yeah, I'd say it even goes beyond kind of developer focused into people who might not even traditionally think of themselves as developers. So it's by lowering the barrier to entry, like there's all kinds of people and all kinds of businesses who are like, I just need to solve this problem using the computer. I need to get the data from this web page. I need to do something with it and then post it to this other form. And like, if you have to like open a ticket and wait two weeks and figure out exactly how you're going to scale your app and what it's going to cost the business. Like it's just going to, you're never even going to do it because it takes too long to get started. But if you can just in 10 minutes hack together a quick solution in HyperDev and say, okay, here it is. It's working. It takes like two seconds to run. And then you have some idea of like how much it costs and how much it scales. And then you can even make those decisions. Like you can't make those decisions. I mean, unless you've written the same thing a hundred times, you can't make those decisions before you start. Okay, so one of the one of the cool things about being able to be on the kind of like a cloud platform, like like you, so like every, every everything, it's it's just a website. There's nothing to download, nothing to, to to do, whatever. You get to do some pretty interesting things. Uh, one of the things looking through um, the website that you guys have is like a, um, I don't know if you want to call it like specifically. I don't remember exactly what it's called on the site, like a collaboration mode or or something like that that allows you to invite other people to work on the same project, um, and then it's kind of like a. a a, a pair programming scenario. Um, how important do you think something like that is to a platform um, like HyperDev? And what are some of the challenges of getting of, of getting things like that working and working well? All right, Persian, you want to start? Yeah, on this the, I'll start with the first half of that. Like the how important um, I think collaboration is. Um, I mean, 
maybe I'm biased because we, we built it already, but I would say like very. And I think part of that is because like, it's kind of tied to a vision of like, what does programming look like in the future? Right now programming is like, um, we have a task, one programmer per task or case or however your business runs. And if you go off, you do it in isolation and you like, you know, uh, push it to version control to Git or whatever. And then that's how things are sort of broken up. But if you need help, like, or if, you know, you're just working on like a hard problem, it's kind of awkward um, right now to do pair programming. Like you physically need to co-locate or do like a streaming thing. Um, but with HyperDev, um, being able to say, hey, I'm working on a discrete task, but if you want to join me, you can join me. It sort of just works like Google Docs. I think that sort of opens up um, the way we sort of think about work and the way we think about like the unit like of a task, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the technical part of it? Uh, yeah, I can add in a few things on that. I think like even though on HyperDev we have this collaborative feature, still 90% of the time you are going to be programming alone but when you do invite someone in like it should just work like magic like they're on the same computer like they're right with you because if that doesn't work then it's like a huge barrier and all of your growth kind of comes from sharing and shared experiences so just by the nature of saying we want to have hyperdev be a live environment where the code one-to-one -one reflects like in the editor is what is running that kind of by default gives you a shared experience because everyone shares that same the code in the editor is the code that's running and so sort of the collaboration kind of falls out of that philosophy of there's one app it's on the internet its code is there and anyone can just reach in and touch it i guess within you know your acl lists or however that's defined but but so, so um, with that, um, I also just want to clarify something real quick. So that also, so when you say one, like there's one app running. So like they're not like, uh, so you don't have like multiple environments or anything like that. Like you have one, like you said, you here is the code that is exactly what's running. As I edit it, that's what that's what gets updated. Yeah. So right now we have sort of one app is one environment. Uh, we have plans for a very simple kind of branching feature where. You can have one app with multiple environments and ways to merge them together. Uh, there's a little bit of nuance that goes into that, but it seems like using tools like Git and things like that behind the scenes that it is fundamentally sol uh, solvable. So, okay, because I, I feel like that will be like uh, you talking about like as you're going because Hyperdev is still in beta at the moment, but as you um, as you know as it grows and the idea of maybe somebody does pick to do this for a for some sort of a production application like i think things like that will make um like i think those are even more like differentiating factors between other things like this that are out there yeah definitely i think uh sort of i can lay out our philosophy on this uh for the future and then months later we'll see how close we actually come but like the idea is we do want to have provide branching sort of a github feature branch based workflow where someone can say, OK, here's the app. I'm going to add feature X. They make a little branch. And then within an hour or a day or however long, then they can merge it back in. And then as people are working on branches, you could just see what other people are working on, jump in, help them out, go back to the main version. Uh, and sort of like it's much, it's like taking everything we're doing already, like all the best practices in Git, but just making them kind of like visible and shared through the internet. So you can just jump in and say, hey, I need some help on this CSS. Do you want to hop in and like have people hop in with that? Uh, yeah, I, then, I think that's really yeah. cool. I think that is really, really cool. Kind of like that, uh, you're talking about like, if you imagine how useful Git is now, right now, what's the process, right? It is, OK, I need help with this. I push my branch up. Can you pull this down, run it on mm -hmm. your computer, and all this other stuff versus just go to this link, here's here's exactly what I'm doing, here's what it looks like when it's running, and to just be able to, I, I, that that seems really, really cool. And that seems like a very, very powerful way of, like I said, of, of collaborating with, with other developers. Yeah, and I think uh, definitely with, like behind the scenes, we'll be using some kind of version control like Git. And ideally, if we do it correctly, when you do check out like the Git repo that is back in your HyperDev app, it should like look like a normal Git repo and make sense and work with all your existing tools. Like we shouldn't be doing anything weird underneath, just like checkpointing at various times and feature branching and rebasing, doing whatever whatever we need to do to like make it look like uh, 
if you were to do it yourself, it'd be like, yeah, that's how I would do it. And then it'd be compatible with all your tools. Kind of like just, a, I'm sorry, uh, kind of like create React apps eject thing, right? Is like it's kind of how I'm seeing is kind of how I'm seeing that of like you start working in this environment in this scenario, and then if you need to do something else, you just pop it out and go along your merry way. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Leon. Yeah, no, no. He's uh, already answered my next question, which was going to be about you know the version control and if you could uh, check out the same project locally and then use your IDE that you love because you know a lot of people might not want to spend a lot of their time in like a browser-based IDE. Um, so it'd be really cool if you could check the same project out, do any stuff you know hardcore stuff locally, and then still make use of the platform. You know the the hosting facilities and the the collaboration facilities as well. That way, well, that would be really cool. Yeah, it's definitely something we would like to support. It's not in there yet. Uh, but ideally, that should work if we do it there right. Is, there is a hack to get that working, where you export your project to GitHub, you know, um, pull it down on your own machine, type some stuff, and then import that project, you know, through from GitHub to Hyperdev. It's really not not the ideal solution, but you can do it if you really want to right now. And that's just oh. by virtue of us just saying we're going to be like as open and interoperable as we can. On the uh, on the web based IDE, is that um, something you guys wrote yourself, or is it an open source project? Kind of what uh, what's the we're tech using behind it? the Ace editor, which cool. is uh, you know the thing by Cloud Nine, uh, which GitHub also uses. But um, we're finding we have to make a lot of modifications to it, and we want to in the future, especially for things like mobile support and whatnot. Yeah, I've got a bit of experience trying to get these um, JavaScript IDEs working across all different mobile platforms, and my god, it is a nightmare. Um, so yeah. <laughs> We, we had to move away from Ace, unfortunately, for that reason. That's what we, we should talk. Draw. We might have the same problems. <laughs> 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 Just make it insert the cursor where you want it to. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, that's, that's a good question, actually. So you're planning on kind of providing some kind of mobile support for, for this kind of platform. Mm -hmm. um, do you kind of see a, a, a future where a lot of people will be doing a lot more dev on mobile devices, like tablets with keyboards, maybe, or even, even touch-based devices? Do you think it could, could move that way? Um, I definitely could see that, like as like the general trend in like consumer electronics is sort of moving to tablets and stuff. Um, I think like computers will always be awesome and exist, but like it's nice to have that flexibility. Even if you just use a phone or you're you're on vacation, and you have a tablet and stuff, just to be able to like fix a bug in bed or something like that. Like that's that's just a cool thing I think to enable. Cool. I so don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. just saying, as someone who, who on his honeymoon was sitting on an island at the bar on a laptop trying to resolve a bug, <laughs> as my new wife looked at me going, is this it? Is this what I've got? <laughs> for next, you know, I would say for like emergency that. use only. Yeah. <laughs> no, did, um, I'm begging we, you. <laughs> please, please, no. We, uh, so we sure had... advertise it. We actually just had a, a, a developer here go on vacation, and um, on the first day, his phone conveniently fell into the pool. Um, nice. <laughs> he sw he swears it actually just he swears it actually just it was a total accident. But I'm 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 skeptical, and at the same time, think he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was gonna say. I was just gonna say. There comes a future where, like, Apple will release the iPhone 8 and it'll be waterproof, and then you'll have to accidentally hit it with a hammer. But uh, one day, <laughs> this, it got caught oh, in the hammer. hammer. Side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what you got a hammer uh, for? Uh, for phone repair, obviously. Yeah, I mean, how uh, do you fix your phones? <laughs> So, um, so actually, talking about the editor and talking about some mobile stuff um, brings up a lot of the uh, actual like design aspects and the UX aspects of something like HyperDev, where, you know, it's very cool to be like, oh, you know, it, de it, deploys, your, it deploys your stuff, it uh, uh, has these awesome collaboration features. All that stuff is really, really cool, but in order for people to want to use it, the actual UX and design of the thing has to work. Um, it has to, it actually just has to work. Um, it has to work and it has to be intuitive, and especially if you're talking about you know, like having things optimized in any way for tablets and 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 mobile. So can um, can you guys speak to kind of like the the design philosophy and process behind HyperDev? Hmm. Okay. I guess I could do that. Um, so I guess the HyperDev has like a we we started writing by writing out like a bunch of principles like what, what do we want um, to prioritize you know in the UI and I guess principle number one is like the UI should never distract you from being in the zone like it should encourage you to get into that code flow um, 
but at the same time, like we want to provide like affordances, like say we have like a branching button or a branchy feature. We want people to be able to discover that and find it. So there's this like balance and tightrope we're sort of constantly walking between um, having things easy to find and also having them having like it being like a nice place to write code in because that's like job one at the end of the day. Um, the other big consideration is that like from day one, we wanted it to just work in mobile, like be fully responsive and, and not be like a compromised sort of version where it was like you're going to mobile.hyperdev.com that has like half the features. So I think those sort of two big constraints sort of drives the design into the direction and the shape that's in right now. Um, and just like we have this really great sort of um, development environment um, when we work on Hyperdev locally where it's continuously integrated and all that. Um, and we have like dev flags and stuff. So I can actually build features and live with them for a while, sometimes in the case of like months. Um, and we go by feel like over time, like is this annoying to use, is this not, should we kill it? And we have like a pretty, we're in a place where it's pretty easy for us to say, cause it's a small team possibly, or just cause you know, we're open to the idea that like killing features is totally cool and killing UI and adding UI, um, you know, just go, being pretty fluid about our sort of development approach. Do you have anything to add, Daniel? Uh, yeah, I guess I sort of agree with that. Like a lot of the time you can't really tell how something works until it is sort of prototyped or in the UI or you've been using it for a week or two. Uh, and so our sort of uh, approach on that is just get something in like as quick as possible and feel it out. And then uh, when, like if it feels right, if it works well, then we keep it, refine it. And if it doesn't work, we try something else. It's a very experimental approach. Um, I've got a silly question. Can you enable a dark theme for the IDE? Uh, there already is one. I built it a couple months ago. Uh, if you log oh, in and then click your uh, user profile picture, there'll be like a switch to night mode or something like that button. Yeah, cool. it was our That's most it. requested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was only, it, we only recently added it. Yeah. But until we added it, it was our number one requested feature. <laughs> That's and that, it still is, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I, I guess it's not. I guess it's not really, Leon. I guess it's not even. It's not really that silly of a question because I am thinking about it. Most IDEs that I can think of, at least off the top of my head right now, the default theme is some sort of a dark theme. I I, I can't. Th I'm I'm actually trying to think of one. Maybe Eclipse. That the default yeah, is a yeah, light it, theme. It, I thought it, with Eclipse Xcode. doesn't. Yeah, with actually oh, a white theme, yeah. yeah. Oh, and uh, WebStorm's default theme actually is white as well. Is it? Yeah, you have to. Um, I installed it today. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you have to, on the install options, you actually have to enable like the Dracula theme. So by okay. default, that's also. But you know, who who chooses the normal version? You know. Yeah, nobody. <laughs> I always Customers found the Dracula the theme name strange. Like, is it sucking <laughs> the life out of you? Like, you know, my editor's about to suck you dry. <laughs> At least it's honest about it, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's up front. <laughs> um, um, so I, I, I had a question. I know I keep getting back to, like, like exactly what the, um, uh, exactly what can be supported by the platform, like languages and stuff like that. Is there any technical reason that, compiled languages wouldn't be able to be used, like backend languages like a Go or a Java or something like that? Or just based on the platform, is it uh, restricted to dynamic languages like um, Node? And you said somebody even hacked away to make Python work. Uh, yeah, I think like there's no technical reason why Java wouldn't work. But the sort of user experience reason, like if you're coming from JavaScript or Ruby or Python, where it's a dynamic language, there's zero compile time. You make a change. And then you see the change in your open tab, your preview window. If that happens like quick enough, it uh, feels really great. But if in like say you're using Java, you make a change that has to recompile like 20 classes and takes like 10 seconds or however long, then like that might feel really bad. Uh, but it might be fine. Like it might be 10 times faster than what people are used to anyway. So I'm not sure. But it just uh, Technically, there's no limit. It's just in the user experience. Like if people are used to this rapid feedback, they'll like leave the web if it's too slow. If it like takes more than two seconds, they'll just say, "I'll do it locally because it's faster." Yeah, it's weird because it's like the whole like action reaction loop is like it's not a thing that like 
works well in like a feature checklist, but I think it's like one of the most important parts of HyperDev. Like, so when we first started building it um, and the build process was a lot slower, we sort of noticed that there were these thresholds and like if the change took more than three seconds for you to see the results of, um, like people just felt like, nah, this is okay, whatever. I'll, I'll probably just stick with my local editor. And then like around a second, like people started, like people started drastically changing at these levels and around like 0.5 seconds to two seconds, it was sort of like, this is like the magic magical place. Um, yeah, so we've always tried to strive to, to keep it down. But I guess, yeah, like Daniel said, the context might be different for a Java developer where like your baseline or your expectation just might be lower. Yeah, although if we do get Java and JavaScript, then we'll have 100% of all developers. So that'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Got them all. Yeah, like Pokemon. Oh, They're gosh. the same language, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> the popular you know, the one. Upset of the other one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't see anything different. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this, this might. This might also be a, a silly question, but so how does? So, so we're so right now. Right now, we've got Node. All that stuff's great. Um, how do we handle things like, um, uh, like environment variables and 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 things like that that would be running? Is is there a way? Is there like just a built-in way where it's like just enter your environment variables here, or are there other things that you have to do, or is it just you have to do it manually on your own? Yeah. So right now we've got a sort of .n file in the editor, and that file is private. Uh, so if someone else remixes your project, they don't get your database access. Uh, and you just put these like sort of uh, key values, kind of like uh, similar to the foreman format of .n files. And then when your app starts up, it just loads those into your environment. So you can put like database credentials, uh, keys to services you use, uh, and they're secure. And then when your app runs, you have access to them using like process.env, uh, and you get those. I think we also put in the port and a couple other things. But so if you uh, follow that 12-factor app, it works like magic. Cool. So so you you've mentioned databases a couple times, and so this and this is part of the the disconnect for me where I'm trying to trying to reconcile what I know from like the like the web-based stuff like this. So it, so when you're setting up a project, can you just install whatever database you want? Can you just install Mongo right away? Is there like, we support these databases that you can use? Does the database have to just sit somewhere else and you can point to it? Yeah, so right now we don't have any, like so Heroku has like components or plugins, whatever they call them. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, tools on the internet also where you can get like database as a service. Uh, and usually those just give you a little environment variable and so if you take that environment variable that you have from some other service and put that into HyperDev, it works. We don't have any kind of built-in uh, components yet. Maybe in the future, we'll have like one click, yeah, just give me a Postgres. Uh, but uh, it seems like that's a solvable problem. We know we can add it if we want to. But since all the existing tools, like we don't want to compete just yet until we're ready to kind of go all in on it. There's yeah, also no, this thing. Oh, so I was gonna say really quickly. Uh, there's also this idea that like, if we wanted to add like a database, we wanted to do it like the right way, and like, doing it the right way is really hard. So like, it's really easy to say, hey, we'll we'll just work with like Mongo Lab or whatever um, off you know out of the box. You can totally use that for now. I do that for my projects. Yeah. No, I, I think that I I think that totally makes sense. It just got mentioned before, and I wanted to make I wanted to clarify whether it was something that was part of the HyperDev platform or if it was separate. But no, I, I think that's a very I think that's a very responsible way to go about it too. Like it sounds like that's kind of been the uh, the some of the core ideas behind it is like if if we're gonna do if we do these things, we're gonna make sure we do them make sure we do them well, um, which I think a lot of people which I think a lot of people appreciate. Yeah, and in the meantime, just using like the existing open interactions, uh, make sure that when we do actually implement them, they'll still be compatible with the existing versions. We're not going to end up doing something weird that like only works in HyperDev and make it like, oh, you have to learn this whole thing. We don't have a Postgres database, but we have a Postgres database that is cooler <laughs> because... It's groovy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's almost compatible, but we won't tell you how it's different. <laughs> Well, and there is that there is a fear of this. I mean, sort of ongoing. You know, when you look at things like that, sort of exist in this space. Parse, you know, now yep. Parse is gone, and then people, ah, what do I do? How do I get things out? And then, you know, there are 
other ones out there that they have similar problems, which is people want to use them for the simplicity because there is that sort of curve, right? I, I want to do something. I want to build something faster, but not necessarily, necessarily understand the inner workings of deploying that thing. So things like databases, I think, have become that sort of thing. And then, but the problem is, is that to get some additional simplicity, you give up some additional freedom, right? Um, yeah. And as developers, there, there, there can be a notion, well, okay, I'll make this simpler. That way I can build this thing. And then, ah, no, I don't want to do that anymore because that is bad and I can't get out. Um, you know, as you start to, you know, look at the languages and features as you develop it out, I mean, what, what are the same things that you hear about most from people? Like, you know, we sort of talked about the dark theme, but I mean, are there like features that people are like, if this had this, well, I would be sold straight away. Is that databases? Is it languages? Is it tooling? Uh, I think right now the main ones are probably branching and more languages are our number one. I guess, Persian, do you have any others we hear a lot? Um, no, those are the big two. Um, and we're always trying to like get reliability higher and higher, get all those nines and such. Um, yeah, yeah, those are the big two. Nines are hard. Like, yeah. You know, I, I, think, I think people fail to realize that. <laughs> we got eights covered, but uh, yeah. still yeah, eight struggling. Unlocked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, have you ever got have you got any other like big plans for the future? Any other big major features you'd really like to get in that you haven't already talked about? Uh, yeah, we probably have like years worth of features. But if we bring them up now, like you know, people will get their hopes up and be like, oh, it's going to take uh, years to get. <laughs> yeah, just the text editing component alone is like a project unto itself on the community side. Like, there's just so much we want to do. And a lot of the features were like from the very first week or two, we kind of like planned out all the stuff we want. Like we're still barely like we're maybe 20% into it. I think the collaborative editing was like the big one that's done as a, because that one has a lot of impact on like the design of the system and how it works. Whereas the other things like say GitHub and version control and archiving and like integration with external things like the, Branching is probably the next one that has like the second biggest impact of like how do we structure internally your project's data so that we can snapshot it, version it, import export with existing uh, VCS tools. It's like that one has a little bit. It's like the next biggest kind of architectural impact. And so I guess we try and start with ones that would have like a if we picked wrong and then had to add this, it'd be like a big problem. So. We're trying to start with the ones that might have the biggest change on uh, the overall structure of the system. Yeah, like sure the editor, everyone. yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm sure everyone appreciate that as well. You know, making sure the things done right is reliable, and then there's you know less changes in the future to the way things work. Yeah, like the editor itself. Like if we were basically to say, it would basically be re-implementing Ace, which took those guys like ten years, and so like that could be a ten-year project, and we'd have oh yeah, we'll have the best autocomplete and the best like jump to definition and the best like integrated snippets where you can be like trying to type something out and Clippy will pop up and be like, oh, it looks like you're trying to merge two <laughs> lists. Here's a sample from Stack Overflow. You want to paste it in right now? And like, yeah, we could have all of that stuff, but that's like but let, 10 years. I know years when you finish that and I'll just clone it and use it in my yeah. own work. <laughs> and you like, start typing, you start smashing the keyboard and you're like, oh, it looks like you're trying to build a to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Half just, of all developers would be out of work. Well, I mean, you get better at copying and pasting, you know, so there's always going to be a lot of, like, mysticism to it. Um, I have, so I, I have one more uh, question slash, slash feature request, um, because the, the entire, th it, you can't tell from from a lot of my questions, a lot of things that I'm, that I'm trying to nail down is, like, you know, like, you know, like, as this thing goes on, like, could this be a replacement for, for desktop editors, for for people like could could I at some point do all of my work here? Um, yes. And I think yes, it's <laughs> just yeah, yes, just just move on. We've answered that question. <laughs> um, but uh, one of my questions is about um, potentially like integrated like unit test support. Um, so, for example, like is it po 
for that to be maybe even part of the platform where it's like, okay, here we can run through all of our tests. Like even if you guys prescribed, uh, you're, we're going to use Mocha for everything or something like that, and here's your formatted coverage report and things like that. Is 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 that something that's on? It, I, I, I'm sure that's probably much further down on the list if it is on the list. I'm just curious if it's on the list. Uh, yeah, it's definitely on the list. Uh, right now, you can sort of fake it by on your NPM, like uh, Sensewood's basically NPM and node projects. You can have uh, in your start script, if you say like NPM test and and NPM run or whatever, then it will test. And like if your test fail, it'll stop your thing from running. That's pretty hacky. Uh, in the future, we can just run the NPM test script automatically, like when your code changes and present a view or a report, like a little console output. Uh, and then after that, the next step is then, okay, in multiple languages, how do, what's like the standard technique for running test scripts in various languages and stuff that like automatically be running based on uh, whatever sort of base project you pick uh, and getting that output into the console, into a view in the editor, having like live updating. It's like that one is actually one of the smaller, well, it's only like a month of work or whatever compared to some of these other things. <laughs> Yeah. But it was got to fit it in the right time slot. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds like adding more light. Like, I can. The more you guys talk about it, I can definitely see why it's important. And we've already mentioned it. Making sure you've got a lot of some of this stuff like really, really nailed down before you start introducing other languages, because that just totally compounds the uh, a lot of these problems. Just from the fact, like you said, like j the 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 best way to test language X is not the same as language Y and the maybe the entire workflow is different. So I so I can definitely I I, I can definitely see how that's I can definitely see how those challenges beca can become even more challenging. Yeah. It's like uh scoping and feature creep also. Like if we just say, oh yeah, testing's really important and it is, but it's like figuring out when to do it. like we know we can do testing eventually. Like it's not it's not gonna change the overall structure too much. It's like okay we just have to do the hard work of for all the language we, for all the languages we support, which testing like tool is the most popular. Make sure we get the top three, and those all work. And we can sort of cheat because, like, on the shell, if you have just one command that runs the test and it has a status of zero, your tests succeed, and a status of anything else, they fail. And then we can show like a little light, and it can be red or green, you know. And that'll go like ninety percent of the way. But then the other ninety percent of the work is just all the edge cases, all the like. You know, oh, I want to use this other testing framework that doesn't respect the status codes because who would respect status codes? And then, it seems silly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, Justin and Leon, do you guys have any uh, any last questions uh, before we before we start wrapping up? I don't know. I have tons of questions, but they're really not relevant to this conversation. I will. I will life. ask. This. What, what did we what did we miss? Like, what was the thing that we didn't ask that we should have asked that apparently we just didn't ask? Like, what is the thing that we should know that you probably want to tell us about this or other things? It's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> gotta, I have to think about the entire universe. I, I've got a quick question. <laughs> do, do you think you'll be able to get to the point where you'll be using HyperDev to build HyperDev? Possibly. Oh, oh, oh we debated about question. doing that yeah. for a while back in the day. Yeah. Well, we're still going back and forth a bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh there's some big trade offs in that and it gets pretty complicated. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually that's... would prefer like it's challenging because like if you use it to build itself, then you can more quickly like solve like really hard problems about how it works, how the workflow should work, having it be uh, quick enough, fast enough, uh, usable enough. But then also, there's like a bunch of other kind of stupid problems, because like, oh, if there's a problem in Ace, or a problem in this component, or a problem in something else, it just compounds. Like, so the same benefits that you get by using it, the compound, the negatives compound also. So it's just like a leverage multiplier. And some of the tools just aren't there yet. So it's... Uh, I think even but in the meantime, we've written micro yeah. yeah, exactly. Microservice and little bits of it are, are separate hyperdev apps that we rely on. That's a good compromise, I think. Is take something that's not like completely core to the service, like maybe parts of the community site or parts of like some of our marketing pages. Yeah, everything. Marketing like simpler pages. standalone pieces and say, okay, 
these are in HyperDev, and now we can have that experience of building them in HyperDev. But if they, like, it's not sort of like the Docker container management stuff where if it blows up, then the whole thing's destroyed. And awesome. it's, like, it's like, yeah, it's like the, uh, it's like the C compiler being written in C, like the, the ultimate, form of dog, ultimate form of dog fooding your own stuff. Yeah. And like some of the parts of it, like, are just not, like, because we do a lot of sort of virtualization and containerization and Docker stuff, like, you need to be a little closer to the hardware than you are when you're running your Node.js Express app. And so it's, uh, like, there might be pieces of it, but it's hard to do kind of ahead of time because if you don't know how the system fits together architecturally, then you kind of have to, like, work around any mistakes you made, and that slows you down. Like, if only we could just step out of it, do it the right way, and then replace pieces. So it just gets... uh, But, yeah, I think we have an okay compromise. There are some components are written in it, but not the whole thing. Cool. I, that would be that would be a hell of an announcement if you could just say like all of a sudden right now the whole, all of HyperDev is written in HyperDev. Yeah. It is just click the remix button, and launch your own. <laughs> <Hyper-Dev>. your own <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's awesome. Um, Justin, did you have anything you wanted to to end on? No, I think this has been a absolutely wonderful show. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. And so, um, if if anybody out there wanted to uh, wanted to wanted to check out HyperDev, if they wanted to, if they had other questions, um, they wanted to get in touch with you guys. Um, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, HyperDev.com, and you can hop in on the editor. There's also HyperDev.com/about, if the editor is a little too intense uh, to just hop into. Uh, you can email me DanielX at FogCreek.com, and uh, tell me your thoughts and feelings and dreams. <laughs> As for me, I'm a little more futuristic, so I have a Twitter account. Ooh, nope. fancy. <laughs> um, and you can find me at uh, PKETS, so that's P-K-E-T-H um, on Twitter. And I have a blog, which I rarely but sometimes write things on at PKETS.org. Awesome. Well, as Justin said, thank you guys both very much. HyperDev is a very cool project. Um, it seems like it is taking like a kind of the next step in, in these, you know, like uh, web-based web-based editors, IDs, what, whatever you want to call it. So, um, again, so just thank you very much. And uh, this has been episode 107 of the Web Platform Podcast, HyperDev and HyperDev in 12 parsecs. And we will see everybody next week. All right. Thanks. Thanks. This is great. You want to learn more about what's coming on next on the Web Platform Podcast? Follow us on Twitter at, at the Web Platform or on Google Plus and YouTube at Plus the Web Platform. We also need your help in creating transcripts of the episodes and helping to create open source projects under our GitHub organization. Contact Eric Isaacson at E Isaacson or Danny Blue at D underscore Blue. That's D E E underscore B L O O. Thank you for listening, everybody, and we'll catch you all next week.